How do you talk to God about the things that you know are just not right in your life? Do we do it as often as we should? Have we had some discipline in it? That is, have we grown very good at it? We can always get better at it. And Psalm 51 leads the way in showing us how. The author in the first two verses gives us three steps as to how to approach God with the things that are wrong in our life. First of all, they focus on who God really is. They get rid of the false pictures of God that keep them from approaching God. They begin to be very honest about what those wrongs are, and they look at it from every possible angle, not a shallow take. And then they consider the work that God will do to rid them of these matters and what it will be like for them to experience God's work in it. Who God is, what the problem is, What's God going to do about it and what it'll look like for you to receive His work? Three words describe that first step. God is a God of mercy. He's a God of steadfast love. He's a God of abundant mercy. It sounds like synonyms in English, but they're, they're far more distinguished from each other in the original language of Hebrew. The idea of mercy is actually the word for gracious. God is a very giving and generous God of goodness. He's not a God who's just waiting and itching to smite you. You need to remember that He loves to dispense graciousness. He is a God of steadfast love. He is a God of commitment. This is His character. He practices faithfulness to us. His love endures forever. And so our relationship with Him is not like a light switch being flicked on and off, on and off all the time. This is a God who is approachable because He is committed to us. He is a God of abundant mercy. The Hebrew word is about compassion. Indeed, it really comes from the root for the word womb. This is where a person is conceived and developed, nurtured and birthed. And that's exactly what's going to happen with you if you become all the more honest with God about your sins. It's going to result in a brand new start. It's going to re involve a lot of matters, and God's up to the task of doing those things with you and calls you to do the same, to, to grow in the process and develop. Well, we need to move to the second step as well, and here the author speaks of another three-step approach to this second matter, that is to become all the more aware of what's wrong in our life and looking at it from different perspectives. They are transgressions, they are iniquities, and they are sins. Again, they may sound more like synonyms, or we simply just use the word sin. How often do you hear the word iniquity or transgression even used? But that's what these matters are. The word transgression is much like our word trespass. That is, you saw a boundary and you deliberately went over the line. You deliberately passed over onto somebody else's property. Something that didn't belong to you, you're treading on now. It's open defiance and rebellion. It's with a will. It's a choice. Iniquity. Many of our wrongs are just that. The word has a sense of crookedness and guilt about it. Imagine yourself going to the meat market and you begin to watch the butcher do their work and you realize that they're trying to trick you. They're trying to short you what you're due. They're charging you for something they're not giving you completely. And that's what our our wrongs are like to God. We're not giving Him our due. It's as if we think we can trick Him and we deceive ourselves in the process. We both get shorted, as it were. And the thought of sin, it is about missing the mark, like an archer shooting an arrow and missing the target. It's also like a traveler, someone walking down a path or a road. They come to a fork in the way and they take the wrong way. Can you say fail? And that's just the word here. It's not so much about guilt or trickery or crookedness or a deliberate act, mindful that you're doing wrong to begin with. It's just, you just plain failed. You blew it. That's what the wrongs in our life are like before God. These aren't all the words that are used to describe these matters in the Scripture, but they're three of the most common. The third step involves contemplating what God will do about these things. What are we asking to God to go to work about? And what would it look like if He did these things for us and with us? 
Well, it would be like blotting out our sins. It'd be like being washed. It'd be being cleansed. Word for blot out is like wiping away. Imagine a student at that time, 3,000 years ago. They have a little tablet frame of wood with wax in it, or maybe there's some damp clay. And the instructor is calling them to write out the Hebrew alphabet. They complete the lesson. The instructor checks their work. And then having checked it, mistakes or not, He tells them to wipe the slate clean. And so they rub or wipe the clay, and you would never know anything was there at all before. They can start afresh and begin to write new things. That's what it means to blot out. To wash. This is the common word that's used for washing clothes. Only now you, the person, is what's being desoiled. You're being de-sinned as God washes you. It's real work think going down to the creek or the stream maybe there's uh, some rocks on the bed of the stream or the creek and you lay your heavily soiled clothes down on the rocks in the bottom of the stream and then you begin to tread on them and to tramp on them to stomp on them to to work that soil out of the clothes and down the stream to be washed there's real effort involved here and if God's going to take care of the things that's wrong in our life It's no small thing, but he's more than adequate to the task. And when the work is done, we'll look very, very different. The word cleanse may seem like a perfect synonym for wash, but it's actually a word that's more often used for spiritual matters. For example, in Leviticus 13 and 14, someone who has a serious skin ailment approaches the priest, and they go through a ritual, a ceremony of cleansing. They walk in saying, unclean, unclean, but the priest dares to approach them, even as they've dared to approach the priest. And after this ritual, this ceremonial cleansing, there is a pronouncement of blessing. You see, here, skin, sin is much deeper than skin deep, and God is approachable. If we'll dare to approach him, he's the one who can cleanse us through and through. The next time you find yourself either being shallow in the way that you talk about your wrongs with God or if you can't even bring yourself to talk with God about them, follow the lead of Psalm 51. Meditate on who God is, what He's really about. Do the same with your sins, as painful as that will be. Don't dare to paint them in light colors. They're very dark. But God is more than adequate to the task. Consider what you're asking him to do with you. And as he does that, imagine what that means for you. I hope you've profited, as I have, from this episode of the Over My Shoulder Bible Study series. These brief videos supplement the sermon that I preach each Sunday here with the Missouri Street Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. God privileged me to preach from Psalm 51 last Sunday. God willing, I'll do the same this coming Sunday. Grace and peace be with us all.